Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Welcome to this webinar today, brought to you by the Australian Water School. It's on 2D and 3D sediment transport and morphological modelling. Mitchell Smith, Ian Tickle and Shuang Gao will be the team presenting today. So good to see everybody here. There is such a large range of people across the world. You can see on the map on the screens there and uh, from all walks of the sciences. And we are just so delighted to have you with us. We're looking forward to a terrific webinar. Mitchell, Ian, Chuang, come on screen. That'd be great to see you. Uh, Mitchell is Associate Principal Engineer at BMT. Thanks, Mitchell, and leads Twoflow FE Software Development. Mitch has worked for 12 years as a project consultant specialising in flooding, coastal hazard and hazard adaption studies. Could say a whole lot more. Ian and Chuang are joining as colleagues. And Mitchell, you call them the brains behind the operation. The Twoflow Development Team, here it is. I mean, you couldn't do better for in modelling. Uh, lovely to see you guys. Mitchell, what is it that drives you to do this? I think yeah, it sort of just generally flows from uh, severe weather events and coastal stuff and uh, computers, yeah. and you kind of end up in yeah. this position. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it'll, be, it'll be good to hear from you. And you yourself, Ian? Yeah, yeah. So I've had a 20-year career now starting in water and then migrating into coastal engineering, and, yeah, I just find it so interesting. So A lot, a lot of time to find out a lot of things and, and to work out a lot of the difficulties. And Shuang, yourself? Yeah, I'm very similar with Ian and Mitch. I started my hydraulic modeling and sediment transport modeling since my master and PhD and just yeah. become fascinated about it. Great news. Thank you, guys. There's one wonderful team in front of us here. I can see that. And I noticed Financial Review has given Tuflo the Innovation Award. And I, I point that out to everyone. There is high regard around for what these guys are doing and their colleagues many of whom have been on other webinars. And I would say also that this webinar is being sponsored by Twoflow. So thank you, Twoflow, and we will be all the better for it, I'm sure. Also, everyone, thank you for filling out that poll before we came on screen just now. Uh, what sector are you from? Mostly from commercial consulting. Would have expected that, I reckon, Mitch. Absolutely. Yeah, it's... Um... It's uh, great that people have done done that poll. It really gives a good good overview for me. And I noticed a lot of people are sort of you know brand new to it, and some have done a bit bit more modelling. So we'll uh, we'll try and aim aim at that. The great questions, great answers. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you know I guess given the the riverine background of the the group, uh, but there's also other other interests there. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll be be good to see a few different examples today from both the coastal and the flood sort of realm. It will. And, and it's wonderful to have those uh, questions answered there. I'm going to hand right over to you, Mitchell. Thanks so much once again for you and your team joining us. It's fantastic. That's, that's great. Thanks, Tre Trevor, and to the Australian Water School. Uh, it's a really great resource online, and I encourage you to check out some of the other webinars that are up there. Some good stuff there. So, so today I'm breaking down this uh, presentation. We'll go through an overview of sediment transport and some of the theory and uh, the process behind it. We'll then go through and talk about some of the different hydraulic models that you, you might want to, to run to capture different flow behavior and some of the advantages of each. We'll go through and at a fairly high level, go through the general process that you would undertake to, to get a sediment transport model up and running and, and the modeling process. And then I'll work through a couple of case studies, quite polar opposite case studies, one looking at some validation of a gravel bed sediment armoring and sorting, and the other one from the ocean coastal sediment as well. I'm going to move quite quickly through this presentation, but please, you've got Schwan there, you've got Ian there. Um, you know, these guys are actually the ones writing the, the sediment transport software as I am myself. Um, so we're happy to, happy to help with those, those questions. So fundamentally, you know, sediment transport comes down to, to moving things from areas of high energy to lower energy. We have different source material, uh, depending on the geology of an area. And as we move from the steeper upper catchment, where it's quite high energy, we move sediment down through the catchment to this transitional transport zone. And then we move into, you know, lower energy environments in the floodplain. So where we have high energy, we have erosion and degradation or lowering of the, of the profile. And where we have uh, lower energy, we have deposition and, uh, and raising um, of the profile. Everything's always changing, okay? You know, in nature, we have periods of very high energy floods or coastal storms followed by periods of calm. And depending on that, that environment, you know, the sediment transport also changes. 
And so the sediment distribution uh, is influenced by the environment, but also the driving conditions, whether it be winds or currents or waves, or gravity or ice. The ones in pink are the ones I'll be mainly talking about today. So here we are up in the mountains. We've got a glacier uh, producing a, a whole heap of sediment. If we look down at the floodplain here, we have you know, quite milky water. There's quite a lot of suspended material in there and a fairly unsorted uh, you know, floodplain of sediment. As we move further down the catchment, we start to actually sort, sort some of that sediment. The finer material gets washed downstream and we're left with these larger you know, boulders and, and big kind of rocks in the creek. Uh, now, under calm conditions, those big boulders won't be going anywhere. But if we were to have a, you know, an event in the catchment, suddenly there's a lot more energy to, to move these things. And we start to see uh, the slow uh, progression of this uh, these large material downstream. As we go further, we start to get calmer. We get deposition and erosion through the transition zone. And when we get down to the, you know, the basically the outlet of these systems, we have uh, alluvial fans and, and deposition. This is a relatively low energy environment. Here's another low energy environment down by the coast where we have mangroves and you know, not much wave activity. And we have deposition of muds and silts and, and the mud flats. Then we have a, a higher energy environment here. Um, you know, lots of sediment supply there. Although if you've been reading the news in Australia, that's probably not looking quite like that. Uh, this week, we have a you know high energy environment, plenty of sediment there. Another high energy environment here, but quite a different sediment source, um, and also you know shingles and volcanic sands on the beach. So, really coming back down to that energy supply and source material. Sediment can be defined you know, broadly by the diameter of the sediment. We have clays and silts, and sands, gravels and cobbles, and boulders, and if we take that that sediment for very small particles like clays and silts because they're so small they can be influenced by biological and electrical forces that can hold them hold them together and we call this behavior co cohesive so muds tend to be be cohesive as the particles get larger uh, gravitational forces become more important than these biological and electrical ones and so sands up to boulders tend to be be non-cohesive in, in nature we can also have mixed sediments. So if we had a, a sand down at the beach that has enough clay and silt in it, then it can actually start to act in a, in a cohesive uh, manner as well. And so we need to be aware of these different sediment types and processes. So in terms of actually moving sediment, currents and waves exert a, a drag force on the bed as they move over it. And it's known as a bed shear stress in Pascal's. Now, on the right-hand side here, we have two different types of sediment. One's a very fine sand that we'll see up in, in suspension up here. And the other one is some pebbles that tend to move in what we call bed load. Now, if there's no flow, we don't get any sediment transport. But as we start to increase the velocity, we get to a critical point where some of these little pebbles will start to sort of shake a bit and they start to move. And then if we add more energy to that system, they'll start to bounce and jump. And if we get to a critical point where there's enough energy, they'll actually get lifted up into suspension. And if the energy is high enough, they'll stay up there. So we've got enough vertical turbulent uh, effects, they'll stay up there. So, so bed load plus suspended load equals the total load in the system. Uh, the smaller the sediment, the more likely that it will go up into suspension. The more energy, the more likely it will go into suspension. And the contrary, the, the bigger the, the rocks, uh, the more likely they'll move as bed load. So what do we need in a sediment transport module to make it, make it useful? We have this uh, effect in nature where we have uh, muddy banks next to gravel channels. We have sandy beach next to mangroves. And so we have these multiple different types of sediment. So we need to be able to discretize our model to have multiple fractions in it. Some of those fractions may be cohesive sediments and some may be non-cohesive. They may move as suspended sediment or bed load. And so we need equations or models that best suit each type of these fractions on a fraction by fraction basis. What can we use these models for? Uh, we've got capital and operational dredging, navigation, port development, uh, scour, whether that be scour around us, a very fine structure, or as this animation on the right shows, uh, scour of a, of a whole river mouth during a flood. So in that animation is a flood wave comes down to sandy opening there. If that scour is not represented, then we might be over or underestimating the flood levels upstream. 
We can also have uh, sandbar and beach nourishment, coastal erosion. We can have water quality interactions, for example, in aquaculture, where we have a, a fish cage, a bunch of sediment will move down into the, uh, sorry, what waste material will move down to the sediment. And it might sit there for, for some time and, and start to change its chemical composition and then can be resuspended and that can be a problem. Uh, alluvial fans and, and these things. So there's many, many applications. So that was a bit of an overview of, uh, you know, quite a high level overview of sediment transport behavior and some of the applications. I'm going to walk through several different, several different types of models here and, and some of the applications for them. Now, if you're into 1D sediment transport modeling, uh, there was a previous webinar on here, uh, which I'd encourage you to go have a look at. It was really, really interesting. Um, what 1D models are great for in sediment transport modeling are, are long time scales, you know, running 10 years, 50 years, and looking at, at broad behavior, you know, modeling a whole reach of the Mississippi River, for example, and seeing how that, that propagates downstream. Uh, for discrete events or at you know, particular cross sections, they can be difficult to, to actually capture the, the scale of what's going on. And so we need to move to more of a 2D or 3D approach. So with a 2D approach, you've got velocity variation that you can capture across the cross section, flow splitting, overbank and floodplain flows. If we move to 3D, we've got helicoidal or secondary currents, we can look at stratification due to density and the like, and counter currents with depth. And then finally, if we want to move to a non hydrostatic or CFD model, we can look at very fine scale uh, structure interaction and turbulence and scour. This is that same scour model I was showing you earlier of the river mouth. It's a 2D model. And we have flows that split around this island. And this video just shows you cutting a, a velocity cross section from the two channels. And so you can understand the different flow rates that are moving down there. That's not really possible with a one-dimensional model to capture that variation. If we're wanting to look at river bends, uh, we can construct a model you know, around, around the bend and we can discretize the, the vertical dimension into layers to allow for overturning and three-dimensional behavior. So this is flow around a, a quite a, a strong river bend. The thing I want you to concentrate on here is this animation down here. As the flow moves around the bend, on the outside of the bend, we get uh, super elevation of the flow. And that super elevation drives a, what we call a, a helicoidal flow or a secondary current around the bend. And these can be, well, these are really important often uh, for sediment transport because we tend to get erosion on the outside of the bend and we get deposition of finer material on the inside of the bend. So fundamentally a three-dimensional uh, behavior. Another three-dimensional behavior is, is density. Uh, so this is a, what we call a salt wedge estuary. We have uh, salt water coming in from the ocean downstream. We have fresh water coming off the catchment. Uh, and in this estuary, we have this salt wedge and there's very little mixing between those, those two layers in the hydrodynamics. Now, if we had some, some nasty suspended sediment from, from waste, uh, and we put it into a, a 2D model at the top here, what we see is that material will move downstream. If we put it into the surface freshwater layer in the middle, we'll also move downstream with that material. But the problem comes is if we you know, hadn't, didn't have this analysis done and we put it into the near the bed, our pipe goes out there, the material actually moves upstream and it, you know, it tends to con continue to, um, it's to build up in that area. So quite, quite different answers depending on how you've represented the hydraulics. This is a hydrostatic model. Thanks Eric Lamont from uh, Flow3D for providing these animations. So if we've got significant amount of vertical acceleration in a model, for example, on the right here, uh, where we have flow going off a weir, or we have very fine scale eddies or vertical rollers that might happen around the structure, we need to start looking at, at one of the CFD models that are available. And so, you know, fine scale pier scour is a, is a great example of where you might need to move to a, to a CFD model. So that's just a quick overview of some of the different uh, hydrodynamic behaviors that you can model with, with these different types of model. Um, and now I wanna move into, you know, what are some of the, the things that we need to start to set up for a sediment transport model? So number one is that we have a, a working and you know, preferably calibrated hydraulic model. Uh, and if we need one, a wave model. 
as I've shown you in those previous slides, if the flow rates aren't correct, if the velocities aren't correct, then our sediment transport is not going to be correct either, okay? So we really need to get, get that hydraulic model uh, nice and tuned. Then we have sediment data and we have uh, you know, different sediment types we can grab. We have our different uh, sediment sizes. Once we know that information, we can look at the different fractions, whether they're cohesive or not cohesive, and pick the models and equations that best suit our study area and sediment type. We then want to estimate the spatial distribution and the thickness of sediment through the catchment. So where is our silt, where are our clays, where is our sand? And then we run what we call a bed warm up to try and reproduce what's really in the field. And then we have this concept of you know, modeling the ambient conditions uh, versus the design conditions. So sediment data, uh, they're you know, very important for our model boundary conditions, but you know, essential for calibration really. And so from sediment samples, we can get you know, size distribution, composition, various parameters like settling velocity, pardon me. We can look at uh, the spatial distribution of the, of the sediment and we can you know, potentially look at how much suspended sediment is coming down the catchment. If we were out in the ocean looking at a dredge plume uh, from, a, from a dredge in 3D, we can send someone out with an ADCP or have a, a, a bed mounted ACP to, to look at how much uh, to total suspended sediment is in the water column. And then we can use that information to, to calibrate our three-dimensional sediment model here with quite high sediment at the, at the base of the water column, now moving up to, to less at the surface. For bed load, we can go out into the river and build a trench and see how that propagates downstream over, over time, or we have bed load traps. And for morphological assessment, if we have regular bathymetric survey, um, that can be very valuable for you know, pre and post events. Now, a good sediment transport model is going to have the flexibility for you to assign on a fraction by fraction basis which sediments are cohesive and which ones are non-cohesive. And so we might go through and we, we pick a certain equation uh, set or model that's more suitable for sand or a silt for settling and erosion, deposition. Uh, some are better for bed load for the critical shear stresses and consolidation. Uh, this example is from, from two flow fees, just one of the sediment fractions. So it's a fine fraction, so like a mud. So we set our you know, particle densities and our, our sizes. And then this is picking a set of settling models and deposition erosion models that are suitable uh, for, for muds, basically. And if we had a sand fraction in the same model, we could set that up as well and have multiple different fractions in that model. Now, this is a, a coastal embayment uh, in the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon of Queensland, Australia. Uh, this is the, the main study area of interest in the middle of the picture here. And what we have is mangroves down, down the bottom here, you know, fairly low energy, uh, lots of silts and clays that build up in there. As we move on to the coast, we have some sort of sandy mixed material. And so what we do is we want to try and have a guess at, you know, based on the data that we have, what, what's the spatial distribution of our two sands we've got? So it's four different sediment fractions in this model, two sands, a silt and a clay. And we have a best guess at what the distribution might be. And then we run the model for a period of time, it might be four months, it might be three weeks, it depends on the system. But what we should see after that time is that the model starts to move things into the places that they should be. So, you know, the clay starts to move up into the mangroves where there's low energy. The sand starts to move onto the, the mud flats and sandy areas. If the model isn't moving the sediment into the areas where they should be in real life, either our forcing, so our waves and our hydrodynamics are all uh, incorrect or need some work, or the way that we set up our, our equations and, and parameters and things aren't, aren't very good. So we want this warm up to allow the morphological uh, bed to, to warm up to a point that we can start the simulation. We have this concept of modeling uh, existing or ambient conditions and then looking at the total, total load. Uh, so I want you to concentrate first on this, this panel here. 
so we, you know, every day if we go out to the coast or in the uh, the river after there's been a flood, we have a certain amount of sediment in in the water column that's just there due to to natural causes. And if you're a critter swimming around in the water column after uh, some dredgings occurred, you're really wanting to know what's the combination of the ambient conditions plus the, the additional sediment load from the dredge because that might be what affects you. So by calibrating the ambient conditions and having a good ambient condition model and then running the total, we can work out the, you know, the, the full impact or you know, full amount of sediment on an area. But we can also you know, cut out and look at just the, the design or the dredge only uh, conditions in this case. So that's a bit of a uh, yeah, very quick run through of what you might consider as you're going through some sediment transport modeling. Uh, I'm going to show you two very different case studies here. The first is looking at some validation uh, lab exercises and field exercises from uh, some bed armoring and sorting work that we, we that Schwan did, to be honest, uh, recently. Um, and you know, this is this this problem we have. Oh, to the the challenge we have with these gravel bed rivers is we have you know quite fine sands uh, up on the banks, and we have the development of what we call an, a bed armor layer. So we have coarser material that sits on the surface and it actually protects the uh, the lower layer. Now this armor layer occurs is because as as the water moves across the the surface, it picks up all the finer material, it moves it either downstream or onto the onto the bank, and this yeah you know, this basically acts to to protect that. So we need a model that can do the the fill, uh, the, the movement of the sediment, so the sorting of the sediment, but also the formation of the the armor layer. So we talked about it earlier, the variation of uh, velocity across the cross section helicoidal flows. What we do is we, we start to move this finer material up onto the inside of the bank and we get armoring down in, in this area as well. So a coarsening of the profile and erosion. This is a lab scale model here. And the important thing to note from this slide is the green line, which is the sediment uh, distribution from that, that uh, experiment. We divide our model up into uh, several sediment fractions and then we can run the flows through our model. Now, the blue here is erosion and the red is deposition from the base uh, starting point. I want you to concentrate on this little cross section here. At the start, it's fairly flat, right, flat bed, but you'll see over time with morphological uh, allowances on, we start to deposit on the inside of that bend and we start to scour on the outside of that bend, which is what we expect. Now, how this looks in terms of matching the measurements, we're seeing general trends that you know, are doing a pretty good job. We're getting erosion where we should see erosion, deposition where we should see deposition, and likewise for, for this case as well. What's probably more interesting about this experiment is the, the grain sorting and the armoring of the model. And so we start with a, around a 1.7 millimeter um, median grain size. So we look at all the grains in this experiment, take the median value, we get 1.7. And as we move from 15 minutes up to an hour, we start to see a real coarsening of that outer bank where the erosion's happening. And we're moving some of the finer material to the inside of the bend. And so that's, that's what we're wanting to, to capture so we can move to a gravel bed modeling system. Mayashima was a, a larger scale experiment, a field scale. Uh, this is after the experiment's been been completed, uh, so you can see some quite you know large large boulders through here, um, and you know a bit of scour on the outside and some deposition on the inside of the bend. Um, again, we discretize the the sediment profile up into several different different fractions, and we start with this trapezoidal channel. And so over time, what we initially see is uh, yeah, so the, the dash line here is the measurements and the, the solid line is modeled. We start to see a bit of a, a slumping or erosion of the, the trapezoidal inner channel and deposition over onto this side and a general movement of erosion on the inside bank to the, to the outside. Again, probably what's more interesting is looking at the, the D50, the median grain size, this is a, a special part of the model where they had some bagging material it's looking at protecting it. So don't worry too much about that. But in the main part of the trapezoid, we have uh, material around 50 millimeters, so quite a bit bigger. 
and then we had these boulders or large rocks around the side. So after the first simulation, what we're seeing is that erosion of that the inner part of the trapezoid. And uh, this green is showing an, an increase uh, in, in the median grain size. So armoring is, is occurring there. And if we move to the, the last part of that, we basically got bed armoring that's occurring right through the center of the channel with some deposition on the inside of the bend. So yeah, so an interesting couple of case studies showing how you might verify uh, some new, new processes that you're putting into your sediment transport model. So the next one is, yeah, it's a, it's a coastal application looking at uh, some, some sand transport around a, a headland. Um, and so quite, quite different processes here. We've got wave interaction with currents. As the sand moves around here uh, due to longshore transport, we get this periodic uh, sand slug that builds up across the, the front of this harbour. And so, you know, if that sand slug builds up enough, you start to get wave shoaling and, you know, this recreational shipping and, and uh, commercial uh, fisheries and stuff in here that need to, to get out. And so it's important for them to have a safe passage. So in order to model this system, we have a combination of a hydrodynamic model and a wave model. So two flow fees providing the water levels and the current speeds. It's also driving the sediment transport behavior. And that sediment transport behavior is either eroding and decreasing the bed level or depositing in some parts of the model and increasing the bed level. All that information is passed to the wave model and the waves are moved in and they respond to the changes in currents and, and bed levels. And then we move back around and go around in this circle basically where the waves and the currents and the bed level and the sediment transport all, all impact each other. This is just a picture of the, of the uh, hydraulic model moving from offshore uh, into this area of interest where we had multiple different uh, different breakwater options to look at to see what, what might work best to, to reduce the issues. The model was calibrated to an ADCP transect, pardon me, so just inside of the, the entrance here. And that gave some confidence about the velocity uh, data that was moving, uh, also model velocity through that, that structure. Again, the wave model was also calibrated moving from, from a larger scale offshore into, into the area of interest. So this animation is quite cool. Uh, the contours on here show us the, the bed elevation. And so as the waves are coming in, which is the time series, we start to see the slow push of this sediment slug or sand slug across the, across the entrance. So uh, the velocity vectors are shown uh, in, in black there. So I won't show the whole, whole thing. Um, but yeah, you basically have this increase in energy and you see the sand starting to move across. Now, once that's all, all done and dusted, we see that the formation of this, this slug that occurs over here. Now, because this is quite an important harbour, the, the operator had you know, quite a bit of, of bathymetric survey, so they'd gone out several times in, in the year and measured where this, um, where this sand slug had, had got to essentially. And so what, what the team were able to do was to look at the, you know, the measurements here in red of the volume of sediment that was in this area and also the predictions and you know, the model did, did a pretty good job of, of representing that, that volume coming across uh, the mouth. So once they had the existing conditions were represented, they could look at different, different options for analysis, so different breakwater ideas, combinations of sand pumping across the structure um, and also looking at potential erosion downstream. So again, quite a quite a polar opposite uh, example there, but really shows you, I guess, the the range of different applications uh, for sediment transport. Um, so just to conclude, you know, we started off the the presentation, gave you some fairly high level uh, information about different types of sediment sources and different types of sediment, the energy that you know we need to to move the sediment and the drivers. Uh, you know, we spoke about that things are always non-stationary. We have cycles of deposition and erosion and non-linear uh, you know, interactions. We have bed load and suspended load, and you know, they're both important to capture uh, if we need them. We have different types of hydraulic models that are very good at solving particular problems. And 
we need to go and look at our study area, talk to our, you know, the local council, the engineers and get an understanding for what hydraulic conditions are important in that area and pick the right tool for the job. We then need data and, and calibration. So I guess this might be the most important point on the slide is that we really need data to, to drive these models uh, and we need to calibrate where we can. Sometimes we don't have data and sometimes we might have to go to the literature or if there's a similar study area next door where you can, you can grab that information, that's always useful. But really trying to get that data is key to having a, a useful model. We look at our different sediment fractions that we have and we need the flexibility to have cohesive and, and uh, non-cohesive sediments in a particular model and we can pick the equations. Uh, we have a, a bed warm up. We have this concept of existing uh, conditions which we can calibrate to and design. And as I've shown you, there's many different applications that you can look at at these models. Um, so the examples I've shown you today uh, are from Two Flows Flexible Mesh Solver, Two Flow FE. So if you're interested in uh, having a go at some of those hydraulic uh, examples, uh, we have a couple of freely downloadable ones from our from our wiki. If you want to grab a, a sediment transport demo and have a play around with it, again, without a license, uh, let, let me know and uh, I can get that out to you. And there's also our, our website now, our sediment transport uh, manual as well. So thanks thanks very much for, for that today. And um, yeah, please, if you have any questions for myself, uh, Ian or Schwan, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Mitchell, what a fantastic rundown. It's been a feast. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ban the, the, the comment death by PowerPoint because nothing <laughs> explains Malulaba, you know, like you've just done. It, it is just having interest in all things marine sailing and surfing. I am so, that is a, a stunning explanation on how that opening for commercial, like you said, and sporting can be managed and modelled first before you're going to even think about managing it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It was really good. That case study was a standout and there's plenty more like that, I guess. Great. All thanks to Tuflo and uh, the team there uh, for their work on this. So now questions coming thick and fast. Shall we get stuck into this, do you reckon? Thanks, Ian and Chuang, for your work in the background there as we've been going through this, as Mitchell's been going through it. All right, then. Let's kick off now with Siddhartha, shall we? The top one there. In Indian rivers, mostly in the north and east, there are lots of sediment. With time, there's a raising of riverbeds leading to more floods and higher HFL. Is dredging a solution? Can it be modelled for decision making? Yeah, I think, uh, and Ian might have some some good ideas too. Like some of the sediment that comes down those big systems is you know is incredible, and I suppose you're really wanting to understand initially what the the load might be coming down. And um, yeah, so that one dimensional the starting point might be be good to to look at that larger scale you know, process. But then you could actually sort of zoom zoom in and and build a more detailed model of your your study area where you're looking at you know erosion and uh, deposition around a particular structure um, is dredging a solution now I suppose it is uh, short short term um, however when you've got that much sediment coming down all the time it would be be challenging I suppose um, yeah. I don't know if uh, Ian or Schwein has anything to, to add to that so I just wrote a quick response but um yeah modeling can certainly help answer various questions that help you assess whether dredging could be a, a feasible or, or even a preferred solution. Just yeah, could answer how effective the dredging might be to reducing flood levels, might help you assess what the infill rates might, might be following dredging and certainly could help to look at environmental impacts of the actual dredging works. Um, yeah. Well, that's great. Okay, well, let's leave that one now. There's a, a big interest in this next question. Mitch, can you discuss what a modeler should do if they don't have detailed Coloration data or, or information from neighbouring areas and catchments available to help tune in the model param parameterization. Parameterization. Yeah. What That's do you recommend? A... Qualitative verification, verification, sensitivity testing. Yeah, it's a good good question. I suppose the first thing is to have a, a look in the literature to see if there's anything uh, similar for that particular sediment type and and behaviour that you could maybe uh, pinch from somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I mean. If you have, if you can look at some some different uh, sets of sediment uh, parameters and do some sensitivity testing on those and see how the the model behaves, what it might 
do it give you a bit of a case to say, okay, well, I run these things and I can see these processes are really important. And you might be able to go back to your, your client or your boss or whoever and say, look, we really need to get a little bit more data data in this area. Uh, if the data is still not available, um, you know, models can still be very good for, you know, uh, the case, you know, comparative case uh, examples where you're looking at the, you know, the impact of two things. So you can still, you know, look at potential erosion or deposition around a structure regardless of, of the data. So it's really how you, how you use that, that model. If you use it carefully um, with the uh, limitations uh, well considered, then they can still be very useful tools. Any additional comments, Ian Schwang? Really hefty question. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really uh, difficult situation in the real world application. W what we see in common application is people try to use different hydraulic model, different sediment uh, empirical formula, uh, uh, just run cup one of simulation to compare what's the worst case scenario. And even in the best calibrated uh, empirical formula, the error between the formula and the measured data used for calibration can be like 100% or negative 100%. So I think it's very, uh, if you don't have any calibration data, you can probably do sensitivity test and uh, it's even okay to try double or half the uh, erosion rate or bed load rate to see what happens and what can be your worst case scenario. Early stages of a sediment modeling study are really critical in terms of collating all available information, literature on, on relevant, um, yeah, relevant literature and data. Um, but a, an important process uh, to sort of bring everything together before you start modeling is, is sort of developing conceptual models of, of what you think the key sediment related processes are and, and sort of where, where you expect your numerical modeling to, to, um, to be able to go and, and what you expect it to, to predict so that you can um, ground truth, uh, whether the, the answers are reasonable and, and help uh, drive the development of that sediment transport model. Okay, let's move on then. Um, thanks, Chris, for that, that really good question. Uh, Brett Miller uh, has said, thanks for the excellent overview. There's a great deal of uncertainty in sediment transport parameters. Would you like to comment on the need to run model uncertainty analysis versus the amount of computational time to run sediment transport models? Yeah, oh, I, I think some degree of sent because of the uncertainty, um, some degree of sensitivity uh, testing is, is usually very beneficial to uh, a sediment modeling study. Um, yeah, you often need to weigh up what the um, time, computational time implications are and, and um, uh, yeah, form up the, the sensitivity testing to something that's going to be achievable and, and uh, help um, inform the level of certainty um, that you need to convey to to the end users or the, the client perhaps in, in the, of the study. Yep, thanks, uh, Brett Miller. Thanks for that question. That was great. Um, I would say that uh, Ian uh, Schwung, if there are any um, questions during Mitchell's presentation that you think are worth raising now, um, you know, by all means, go back through them and let's uh, let's uh, bring them up again now. But there's plenty more questions to go on with as we go through these. Should we go to the next one on, uh, from Rusty Jones? For the last example, you showed looking at different breakwater options, what approach was selected? I think that's the Malulavar Queensland um, uh, sand one. I think it's one, is it? Yep. Yeah, is it? Can you see our screen okay there? Yep, clear. Yeah. So I think they, they were looking into option B um, and a combination of having a, an extension of the structure, but also having some sand pumping. You know, basically, if you're putting this, this up here, you're starving the downstream area of, of sand. And so, you know, that could lead to erosion of, of this area, which wouldn't be ideal. So a bit of a, a hybrid uh, solution, I suppose you might call it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Sounds good. Cray Price uh, got a great question here. Thanks, Cray. Um, can you comment on non-Newtonian fluids and the sensitivity of modelling results to the adopted viscosity? Any special consideration to pitfalls when simulating mud, slurry and debris flows? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, mm -hmm. I think Rudy also had a question regarding non-Newtonian flows as well. So, so I haven't spoken about it, about it today. Um, 
you know, most of the, the things we've been looking at are what we call Newtonian floats in that they, once you get a certain amount of, of um, silt or mud into a, a material, it starts to, to move like a, a plug flow um, and yeah, the, the shear forces and things that are applied to it can change. So, so in our sediment transport model, we don't have um, you know, the, the effects of, of non-Newtonian flow in here yet. In our hydraulic model, we, we allow for that, uh, whereby we change the relationship for the, the Manning's coefficients to, to allow for that. But uh, simply put, if there's enough mud in a material, it stops flowing like water and we need to change the, the approach. So you know, often for, uh, for debris flows, um, or for slurries and things, it's not appropriate to use, um, you know, Newtonian, Newtonian flow. So I don't know if that ans answered the question. Um, I think it would be inappropriate to do sensitivity testing with one of these sediment, well, particularly our sediment transport module for, for non-Newtonian um, flows. Um, but it's something we're looking looking into. So Ian, did you have any thoughts on that? Or um, may have a, a completely opposite opinion of that. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think, think you've captured it. Yeah, if you've identified that there's so much sediment um, entrained into the water column that it's, um, yeah, affecting the behaviour and it's more of a debris flow rather than a um, water um, suspended or sediment suspended in water, then, yeah, you, you'll need to use a numerical model that, that captures that additional physics. And from the top of my head, I think it was like maybe twenty or thirty percent solids or something. You start to to get that that effect, but it depends on the on the material. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a a key thing that um, th there can be a lot of uh, differences in in requirements of sediment transport models depending on the particular question that's being asked of them, and you, it's not guaranteed that that a particular scheme will have been developed with a, a particular application in mind. So that's, uh, I think, a key on, on the requirement of the modeler that they, they match up the, the application and, and the software and make sure that they're, they're comfortable that, that, they're, that they are well matched. All right. Yeah, thanks for that. That was a good question. Uh, Bambang from Indonesia. Uh, next question. Semarang has a main watershed that has a rapid growth of residential so the impact is raising the detergent contaminant on the river. I think the detergent contaminant, contamination has a strong correlation with the sensitivity of the riverbank to easily erode. What do you think about this? I might throw that one over to you as well, Ian, if you have any uh, thoughts. Thanks, on that. Yeah, well, it, <laughs> it's an interesting question. And it, it, mm. yeah, it's not one I've got an answer to. But um, yeah, the, there can also be a, a lot of, I guess, complicated um, biogeochemical kind of processes that, that are can be relevant to some of these sediment transport related questions. Um, I haven't heard of this kind of correlation between a detergent contaminant and and um, change in, in riverbank sl slumping behaviour, but if that hypothesis is, is correct then um, and, and modelling is considered to be an important way to, to, to look at the problem or solutions to it, then yeah, I, I expect that yeah, there'll be some challenges or that, that might be a new field of modelling, at least for me, um, to, to, to look into that further. But yeah, very no. interesting. Good thinking, everyone. Thanks so much for your questions. They're fantastic. Jaco says, can two flow be used for long-term morphological change of landform with a rain on grid approach? You could try. Um, I think that at the moment, like computationally, it, it is a bit of a challenge to, to do I suppose when you're saying long term, you're talking like five or ten years or something like that, or maybe you're looking at a, um, you know, a, a mine rehabilitation or, or something like that. So, um, I think as computers advance, they'll get faster to be able to to do that. I mean, you certainly could could uh, run the, those things. Um, one of the things we certainly need to to work on uh, at the moment is the the lateral uh, erosion as as you move. Uh, uh, you know, flood uh, a flow path down downstream. So, I think it will evolve in this space. But I think currently, you know, it's going to be be challenging to to model that. Um, I think over time, given these the nature of this stuff is so chaotic, we might eventually move into a position where you can do you know some sort of semi-stochastic analysis where 
you run a, a whole range of different sediment transport morphological runs and start to sort of get a, an average answer through through the floodplain. Um, so I guess watch this space um, would be yeah. my answer. Yeah. Um, no worries. Thanks. Thanks, Jaco. Uh, Martin Jacobs, can you comment on the design of training walls in the era before modelling? Presumably some worked well, some didn't. I, I guess as a, a, somebody working in the coastal engineering field, yeah, there's definitely um, there's plenty of cases where there's training walls or, or, or schemes that were built some time ago that are not working so well and, and requiring on, ongoing kind of uh, modifications or, or, or treatments to to deal with them. And on, on the other side, there, there are plenty that are working as, as they were no doubt originally intended. Yeah, these days we are lucky to have more ways that we can look at things um, before committing to, to, to building them and, and we, we have, have better tools, um, including numerical models and, and also physical modelling, which was, was a, a bit of a go-to and remains an important part of our design and uh, assessments uh, these days, when, particularly when it comes to, to things like um, morphological processes and how they interact with structures. That's great. All right, we'll move on, shall we? Uh, James Zahn, can two, flow model, uh, can two flow model sediment load and transport in overland runoffs? It can, yes, is the answer to, so to that. Right. Yep. Okay, that's great. And Diane Wiesner, many of the tropical streams with channels to the sea have significant mangroves, which would presumably inflict, impact the flow pattern and type of sediment that is left dominating the mix of materials needed to be carried to the channel opening. What allowance is built into your models to cope with this eventuality? I think the allowance or the, the, the way to treat that in, in the model is... Um, to have different material zones and, and different um, seabed properties uh, associated with, with different parts of the model. So an area that's dominated by, by mangrove forests will have uh, a lot of subgrid scale roughness associated with the actual mangrove trees and their roots. Um, that would be um, reducing flows and, and um, resulting in a, a more depositional kind of environment because of the reduced um, uh, flow energy. So that's the way that a, a new numerical model, I guess, would re resolve that. Um, we usually start with the representation of how the system is now, and, and there's already sort of extensive mangrove forests in, in a lot of estuaries. So we, we, we capture them as, as they sort of exist now. Yeah. Great. That sounds good. Tertha, thanks, AWS, Australian Water School. This webinar was very nice. Here. In Nepal, we have a high soil erosion with riverbank erosion. Can you recommend the best model for sediment transport? I think you're going to say two, two flow. <laughs> well, no, I'm not going to ever say that, to be honest. Uh, like I said before, the, the best tool for the job. If you're looking at very large, um, you know, long reaches of, of river, um, over long time periods, you know, one-dimensional models are, are excellent to to give you the average average load as you're moving down through the, the catchment, and also you know, longer term um, you know, deposition or erosion over time. If you're needing to look in a, a discrete area, um, you know, where the the actual velocity distribution around your study area or your structure, or there's three-dimensional behaviour that you are very important to your structure, then then you need to you can look at a, a 2D or a 3D model. Um, so it, it really depends on what you're trying to, to solve there. Um, but yeah, there is always a challenge in, in those regions of just the sheer amount of sediment coming, coming down. So it might be a combination of different models um, that you need to, to have a look at to, to get what you, you want uh, for the different scales involved. Yep, that's great. Let's go to Amange, shall we? I have one more question. In case of a non-equilibrium sediment transport, what would be the best approach to deal with from a numerical modelling point of view? I guess I'm going to have to infer what is meant by non-equilibrium sediment transport there. Um, my take on it is that it might refer to modelling wash load coming down a river. Um, so the, the amount of sediment load depends on, on what's being delivered from the from the upstream reaches, um, and and it actually is, doesn't matter how much energy there is in in the particular reach that you're looking at. Um, it's it's all based on 
on the upstream boundary condition, um, in which case, yeah, prescribing that, um, having good data to inform that is, is going to be going to be critical. Um, so that's that's my interpretation of that, but I, I might have uh, interpreted that wrong. Um, no, that sounds good. I reckon we might we might leave it at that. Uh, we're pretty close to the uh, to the end of the our, our one hour, and it's been just a really great. It's you can see how big this field is. It's been a really great coverage of of many uh, detailed issues, which can't be done in one hour, of course. Like I said, so I think we might wrap it up there. I really appreciate everybody's involvement, especially three team from Two Flow, uh, Mitchell Schwung and Ian. Fantastic. Uh, you'll see in the chat line all the uh, links to this, this screen that's on, the, on your screens now. I've really enjoyed this. It's a big thank you to the team at Australian Water School, but most of all to yourself, Mitchell, Ian and Schwung, and the Two Flow development team. We're indebted to you for a fantastic presentation. Wonderful. Any last words from yourselves? Uh, thanks everyone for, for joining us and hope you have a, a good holiday, a well-earned uh, rest and, and new year. And um, again, Australia Water School, uh, yeah, we really appreciate you putting on these these events. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Be, be tuned in uh, on our website, Australian Water School website for future webinars and uh, courses and live training. That'd be great. Wonderful. Have a great Christmas, everyone. Good break. See you, see you for now. Bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.